geopolitics of the Caucasus since the end of the Cold War have been changing uh, uh, with wars and uh, enduring conflicts. And this is a, a very a permanent, it, it has become a kind of a structural uh, qualities of the region that a uh, number of conflicts that emerged here, uh, in early 1990s have not been solved. And uh, they keep continuing and keep recoming. Um, we used to employ the terminology of frozen conflicts uh, and at the same time not believing that they, have, they were frozen, but nevertheless uh, we use that terminology uh, to refer to them. This is, a, a, for me, it's a, a reminiscence of pre-20th century Caucasus. Because when you look back, uh, the history, uh, our Polish colleague uh, already uh, looked uh, rather deeply, but I will just repeat one uh, aspect of it. If you look at the history, this region, very small region of the world actually, has been, was uh, a, a, a scene for conflict uh, and competition between three empires, right? Russian, Ottoman, Turkish, and Persian empires. That was the defining characteristic of the region before the 20th century. Of course, during the 20th century, it was the Soviet, uh, I would call empire, uh, that imposed a, a, some sort of a stability to the region. A stability that regional people, the countries, and the people in the region were not happy to have any of it. Uh, but it was a different type of stability. Uh, so since the end of the Cold War, we, it, it looks like a deja vu. We moved back to pre-20th century uh, Caucasian uh, uh, geopolitics, and there has been a number of uh, uh, circles of competition. It's not one competition anymore. It, it, in the history, it was much easier to define the competition. Uh, in the, since the end of the Cold War, the competition has, it, it looks like a co-centric circles. There was a competition in 1990s mostly between Turkey and Russia, a very intense competition, uh, and it was not only about the Caucasus, it was, it was uh, in the wider geography of what I would call Eurasia, from Central Asia to, uh, to the Balkans. Uh, but in the 2000s, there was a competition, an in, uh, influence game between two greater powers, outsiders, outside greater powers, uh, between uh, Russia again on the one side and the United States on the other side. Uh, there is a, a, a competition between the regional countries. Uh, although we had experimented, or at least we had discussions on number of suggestions for regional integration, uh, you know, some friends of mine call them uh, uh, alphabet soup, uh, because of number of mathematical formulas like you know, 3 plus 3 plus 2, 2 plus 1, and you know, so on and so forth. None of these discussions led to any, anything because the regional countries watch each other uh, and also they are in competition with each other towards especially to the attention of the outsiders. You know, it's whether it's the European Union or whether it's the United States or whether it's Turkey, the regional countries also are in competition with each other uh, uh, for the outside uh, attention because they factor or they think that this, connect, this kind of connections with outside powers will help them to have more influence within their own region and, uh, and that's also another uh, circle here. Uh, this, is a, this has been a quite a well-known and well-established uh, structural characteristic of the region until 2008. Since 2008, what's changing the regional geopolitics is Russia, uh, and in different, uh, uh, different way. Up until 2008, it was a very quite well-known Russian involvement in regional conflicts, uh, very indirectly usually. Uh, they try to leverage the Russian positions in the region through a uh, number of uh, the so-called frozen conflicts. But since 2008, the Russian aims in a wider geography, not only focusing focuses, but in a wider geopolitical region, uh, including Black Sea and I would argue Mediterranean, uh, there, there will be a consecutive number of wars. Uh, and some people call it Russian comeback, some people call it Russian resurgence, uh, some people call it Russian uh, uh, re-empire, establishing re-empire or whatever. Uh, but this is a direct challenge from Russia uh, to uh, what it saw uh, a sovereign choice from regional countries. Uh, 
that it didn't like. Uh, 2008 was one of the first examples and we had so many meetings in here also uh, to talk about it. We argued and I still argue that the inability of the Western powers to stand up against Russian aggression in 2008 led to 2014 and led to uh, final uh, attempt for occupation of uh, Ukraine and that's the real um, basis of change of geopolitics in the region in recent years. Uh, challenging of Russia uh, have been uh, quite difficult for not only regional actors but nearby actors like Turkey and also far away actors like United States uh, with fleeting interest. I would say fleeting interest because when you look at it, the outsiders have a wider geopolitical interest and especially if it's United States, it is a global interest. Uh, if it's a European Union, it has a, a, a so many interests clashing of its members, it's unable to develop a geopolitical position, especially regarding towards this region. Uh, I have been involved uh, and talking uh, with a number of uh, European representatives, EU representatives to the region uh, from, from the earliest days and never come across a geopolitical or strategic approach from the European Union to the purposes. Uh, the second point I'd like to make, which I already said, but you know, expand on it, now with the Russian uh, military uh, military operations since 2008 and, and, and the others, uh, it has created a wider geopolitical region. The Caucasus is, cannot be analyzed now as Caucasus, because this is a region now uh, in, in an interaction in the Black Sea, wider Black Sea region, it's part of it anyway, but it's now what's happening in wider Black Sea in Ukraine is affecting what's happening in the Caucasus, and it will affect what's happening in the Caucasus. However, with the Russian behavior, especially since 2014, Black Sea is not confined to Black Sea either. The Black Sea and the Mediterranean, especially the Eastern Mediterranean, has become one of one unit of analysis from geopolitical perspective. Because Russian act actions in the Middle East, in the Mediterranean, and what I would call Levant region, was supported by Russian Black Sea Fleet based in Crimea, the occupied Crimea. So the connection was very clear uh, from 2014 onwards. Uh, Russian establishment of a, a, a Mediterranean fleet uh, was supported by, again, from, from its Black Sea Fleet. Russian operations in Syria was logistically supported by its Black Sea Fleet based in Crimea. So when you look at all this, you can, we can, and you can understand the geopolitical importance of Russia, for Russia, the Crimea, why it occupied Crimea in the first instance. Uh, so, when we are looking uh, for the future of, uh, the, future of the uh, Caucasus, we have to be, we should be looking in, a wider, in this wider geography uh, and the geopolitical changes, there, which makes it uh, much more complex. I will come back to this point. Another point, since 2014 uh, and uh, leading up to the uh, uh, Russia-Ukraine uh, war is the militarization of the wider Black Sea region. Uh, this also um, have a, a limited effect on the Caucasus, but having a wider uh, Black Sea become militarized, excessively militarized, with especially Russian investment on uh, Black sea, it's on its Black Sea fleet uh, and also on its uh, uh, defense systems, land-based defense systems in Crimea, in North Caucasus, uh, and in the Caucasus itself. Uh, the region has become overly militarized. The war, the final war of uh, Ukraine, was actually a, a kind of a, a outgrowth of this uh, militarization uh, of the of the region. What all these wars so far since 2008 have shown uh, is a number of uh, aspects. One is, and I think we have all, all deduced these uh, lessons. One is Russia cannot abide with the choice of its neighbors, independent choices of its neighbors. Of the, its, uh, what it called 
since uh, the mid 1990s, Russian near abroad. Uh, we all analyzed it. We all talked about it. But it seems that Russian near abroad is important, and it seems some some sort of a sovereign operational area for Russia. We neglected that. That we just thought that this was a a kind of a demonition of a region uh, from a political perspective. It seems that Russia takes it very seriously and thinks that this is the area that it has a right to have military operations when it deems necessary. And a uh, number of wars have already uh, uh, proven that. Another lesson, I, I think this was a lesson from 2008 and it's repeated afterwards, is that Russia is too near and the God is too far away. And, I mean, this is a bitter lesson Caucasian people got it from the history. It's not a new lesson. You know, this is a, I, I'm repeating, of course, the things that I heard in, in the caucuses over the years. This is a historical lesson re-emerged from 2008 onwards. Russia is here, and any attempt to dislodge it creates conflict. This, of course, I'm not saying that there shouldn't be an effort to dislodge it, but we have to be aware of the reality. Another lesson is, and it's very clear now, Russia is willing uh, and uh, willing to use force to further its political aims and, if necessary, challenge international uh, order. Uh, when you listen to the Russian argumentation, uh, President Putin's argumentation or any other uh, leading Russian officials vis-a-vis uh, -vis Ukraine, you would start thinking in, in what kind of a world they are living in. You know, the arguments they are using is not of, from the 21st century. The arguments are like from the 17th century, even 16th century uh, of European geopolitical games. Uh, talking about historical realities and historical rights. And if we all start talking about our historical rights and feelings, well, we know what happens. Last night we've been talking, one of the clear uh, characteristics of Armenia is that Armenia has a deep history, right? long, long, long history. Uh, well, all of us have. You know, if you talk to the Azeris, they will say you know, they have a huge historical background. If you talk to the Turks, everybody originally were Turks in the world. And you know, if you talk to the Georgians, they will say this, repeat the same story, <laughs> including the wine. Of um, so, I mean, listening to this kind of argumentation is very clear challenge for international uh, system, uh, international order, international uh, regulations. Uh, another lesson, I think, it started in 2008 and led to 2014, maybe now changing, is that the West cannot protect the regional countries from Russian aggression. This is changing now with NATO uh, start finally started to uh, uh, creating what I would call the wall of defense uh, in Western Black Sea. But this has not yet uh, reached to the Caucasus. Right? The NATO uh, reorganization of its forces and its uh, planning is so far uh, are uh, about Ukraine and the challenge that Russia is presenting in Eastern Europe towards the NATO territory. It doesn't involve the eastern part of the Black Sea, that's the Caucasus. Uh, so uh, the question remains whether if there is a, another challenge in the Caucasus by Russia, would outside powers, including the West and Turkey and other outside powers, would they be able to help the regional countries to, to sustain their defense? Another lesson is economic cooperation in this region with the regional countries and outside countries would be tolerated, would be accepted by Russia, but not political and especially military cooperation. Anytime regional countries try to create an open military cooperation with outsiders, there has been a reaction from Russia. But obviously, the final lesson I draw from all of this is there is a need to balance Russia in a wider context. It's not the Caucasus. We cannot focus on Caucasus balancing Russia. We have to focus on a wider geography, including the Black Sea, 
uh, the, the Levant and the Mediterranean so that we can be, uh, we can be balanced in Russia. Why I'm focusing so much on Russia, not only because the title of the conference <laughs> says it, but I fundamentally believe, believe that it's the Russia that has been challenging uh, the balances created in the region since the end of the Cold War. None of the regional balances that emerged, uh, the geopolitical balances in the region, uh, Russia has been happy with. They keep challenging it uh, for a better, for themselves, for a better region. Uh, recently, of course, a number of uh, uh, actors are trying also to make a comeback to the Caucasus. Uh, one of those, of course, is uh, European Union. Uh, we already heard the European Union attempt of uh, enlarging it with new membership. As far as the Caucasus is concerned, uh, so far it's only Georgia and it's half-hearted yet. And one thing that we all have to remember regarding the EU membership is that although I believe it's more than political, uh, economic and uh, it has a political implications, it usually takes years uh, to finalize. So the EU's impact in the Caucasus will be in future. Right? If, it's, it, 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 if it's finally uh, enlarges to uh, include Georgia, EU would be an actor in the Caucasus. But it will be in years. It's not in the next maybe 10 years. Uh, as I said, NATO so far have no really a no strategic policy and strategic inclination towards the Caucasus, except NATO member country Turkey is quite active uh, in training um, Azerbaijani forces and also have been in military cooperation with Georgia. But I have my doubt whether this is a this could be counted as NATO influence in the region. Right? It's more Turkish influence uh, to rule NATO. U.S. is still oscillating uh, between uh, uh, isolationism and act international activism. And we are all everywhere, I mean, in Ukraine, in wider Black Sea, and in the Caucasus. We are all waiting what the elections of the United States are going to present us. We don't know what will be the U.S. policy in a year time. Uh, U.S. was quite active in the Caucasus, as we all know, uh, after the 9-11 events. And the reason of that activity was not about the Caucasian countries. It was about the needs of the U.S. for securing its interest in sub-regions of the world. One of them was the Caucasus. Th that activity, and especially the focus on the Georgia, uh, ended quite up abruptly after 2008 and the United States withdrew from the region. When I say region, and it was not only the Caucasus. It withdrew from the Black Sea. There is no mention of Black Sea uh, in any uh, uh, American strategic documents until last year. Now they are debating uh, to develop American, for, uh, American strategic policy for the Black Sea, which, by the way, do not include the Caucasus. So we don't know what's the American uh, strategic position uh, in the Caucasus, what they are ready or prepared to do in the Caucasus yet. Uh, some European countries obviously try to be more active, primarily uh, France, especially to Armenia, uh, but it's, their action is limited and their influence are still limited. So this leaves uh, uh, two actors, the, both regional and outsider, uh, Turkey and Russia. Uh, and it is, of course, when you talk Turkey and Russia, to say that their relationship is complex is nothing. Right? It's ultra complex. Or, you know, yesterday night we were in deep discussions about this, right? Uh, and I said, you know, there are four, five, six layers in Turkish Russian relations. And you, people just pick up one of the layers and they assume this is the case. You know, there is a competition between Russia and Turkey. Sure. There is a huge historical rivalry which continues today. Sure. There is a, a, a cooperation between Russia and Turkey. Yes, that's true. There is a tremendous economic and trade relationship between Turkey. True. Turkey does not cooperate with Western sanctions on Russia. Turkey bought S-400 missiles from Russia. 
but Turkey is supplying Ukraine a valuable military gear uh, and, uh, and building up uh, four corvettes, for example, to Ukraine to use in the Black Sea against Russia as well. Turkey is keeping uh, uh, the straits closed, which originally people thought that it might help Russia because Russia had the upper hand in the Black Sea, uh, navy, in the naval for, uh, first, but now one third of the Russian Black Sea naval force is decapacitated uh, by the Ukrainian attacks, and Russia is unable to replenish of its forces, naval forces in the Black Sea because the straits are closed, so it's hurting Russia now. So the, the relationship between Turkey and Russia is very complex. And when you look at the Caucasus, there is an interesting, um, uh, in interesting reflection. First, Russia, since the end of the Cold War, this is the first time after the Second Karabakh War, Russia have military forces in all three countries. I would include Abkhazia and South Ossetia and Georgia here. Their qualities are different. In Azerbaijan, they are peacekeepers. Uh, well, supposed to live in a few years. Uh, in Armenia, they are here with the bilateral agreement, uh, defending the borders. Uh, in Georgia, they are partly occupiers, partly peacekeepers, or whatever they call themselves. But the fact that the three Caucasian countries now have Russian military forces on their soil. We have to take that into account. Secondly, for the first time in a hundred years, Turkey has a military contingent in Azerbaijan after a hundred years, which is the number is very small. It's, it's not important militarily, but psychologically and politically, I think it's, it's quite an important and it it's shows Turkish comeback to the Caucasus uh, after, the, after some hit house since 2008. After 2008, Turkey also, alongside with the Western countries, somewhat withdrew from the competition with Russia in the Caucasus. But now, despite the seeming cooperation between Russia and Turkey to the detriment of Western influence in the Caucasus after the second Nagorno-Karabakh war, Turkey is more firmly back to the Caucasus in competition with Russia at the same time. Uh, we have to, when we are looking to Turkish-Russian uh, relations and how that impacts the Caucasus, we have to again look into the wider geography. Turkish-Russian relations are conditioned by Turkish-American relations, especially in Syria and Iraq. Turkey is gravitated to cooperate with Russia more and more because it has a problem with the United States in Syria and in Iraq because the US has connections with the Kurdish groups there. I keep repeatedly say that for Turkey, Syria is a survival issue you know, on that level. Ukraine is a regional security issue. Right? We have to see the difference between the Turkish policy towards Syria and Turkish policy in the Caucasus. Uh, sorry, in the Black Sea, uh, from this perspective. So the Syria, in that sense, and Turkish-American relations in Syria regarding the Kurds have determining effect how Turkey approaches to, the, uh, to Russia. Because Russia is the only actor that allows Turkey to balance the United States in Syria. That kind of a cooperation that then enhances or weakens, if you, if you like, from that perspective, weakens Turkish hand uh, in different theaters against the Russian uh, influence. Or the challenging Russia becomes as difficult as when you are cooperating with Russia in one theater of operation. Nevertheless, Turkey has been challenging Russia, interestingly, uh, in different theater of operations. In Syria, Syria is included. Not directly, but with kind of a proxy warfare uh, Turkey has been operating in Syria against the Russian interest also. In Libya, we were in different uh, sides. In Nagorno-Karabakh, obviously we were not opposing to each other, but the Azerbaijanis were using Turkish strategies and, and, the, and the drones against the Soviet era or Russian... Uh, oh, it was, sorry. 
so Russian uh, security um, defense mechanisms, and they were successful. And we are doing the same thing in now Ukraine. So to say that this relationship is complex is nothing. Uh, the cooperation, yes, but confrontation. And Turkey was, I, I have to repeat this and remind everybody, people usually forget this. Turkey has been the only NATO country since the Korean War to shut down a Russian plane. I'm not proud of it. Uh, I'm not sure the Turkish leaders are proud of it. But that's the case. And, you know, it, it, it sounded crazy at the time, 2015, but it happened. Uh, any other NATO country, they became very worried that this kind of a behavior, Turkish behavior, uh, unpredictable Turkish behavior, might lead a war between NATO and, and the Soviet uh, and Russia. They were right, but nevertheless, the case remains: Turkey is the only Western, only NATO country that shut down a Russian airplane since the Korean War. So the relationship is complex. Regarding the Caucasus, and I'm, I'm finishing here. Now oh, you have time. Okay. Um, realistically, I would argue Turkey is the only country in this vicinity that can challenge Russia in the Caucasus and in the Black Sea if it wants to. This is an important caveat. Uh, Turkey has been, the lessons that I listed for the Caucasian countries also lessons for Turkey too. Because 2008 was an eye opener for Turkey too. Up until 2008, Turkey was a very clear opponent of Russian influence in the Caucasus in Central Asia, less so, but in the Caucasus and the Black Sea. But 2008 showed that when Turkey was sidelined in the Caucasus, and when the countries in the, in the neighborhood didn't listen to the warnings that was coming from the Turkey, there was nothing that Turkey could do against Russia by itself, because its alliance partners in NATO were not doing or cannot do anything else as well. So that left Turkey also alone in the Caucasus and in the Black Sea facing that Russian uh, resurgent naval power. You know, 2011 is the turning point in the Black Sea. Up until 2011, the Turkish naval force was the upper, uh, had the upper hand in the Black Sea since the end of the Cold War because of diminishing uh, Russian ability to keep it Black Sea force. <clears throat> but by the 2011, Russia became the dominant sea power in the Black Sea. This was then supported by 2014 with the occupation and annexation of Crimea and taking over of a uh, whole territory. From 2014 onwards, Turkey and Russia has almost the same territorial waters across the Black Sea as they had during the Cold War. People do not remember, but during the Cold War, it was Turkey and the rest. You know, the rest was controlled by Soviet Union and its allies. That this is what Turkey saw after 2014, because the naval forces of Bulgaria and Romania is nothing. The other uh, Ukraine didn't have anything after Crimea. Georgia doesn't count there, and it's only Turkey. Uh, there is a challenge here, obviously. There is a push factor coming from different countries, especially uh, from the region, from re uh, from Romania, and sometimes from Bulgaria and outside the region, sometimes from the United States, to open up the Black Sea for outside forces to come into the Black Sea with their naval forces, the NATO forces. And this is a policy that Turkey adamantly rejects. Again, let me remind you history here, why Turkey is so uh, adamant to apply the Montreux Convention to keep the Black Sea for the Black Sea countries. Since the 17th century, when uh, then the Russian uh, Tsarist Empire occupied first time the Crimea, since then, the, one of the leading factors of the warfare in Eastern Europe, uh, in uh, what Turkey is now connected, uh, situated, was the control of the Straits. 
which country is going to control this trade. The first global war before the world First World War, that's the Crimean War, was actually fought about this issue, on this issue, exactly. The, during the First World War, one of the biggest uh, battles of the First World War fought over the control of the uh, Dardanelles and the Straits. At the end of the Second World War, people ignored this. In 1945, in Posta, Russia, United States, and United Kingdom, their presidents and prime ministers, uh, prime minister in the case of UK and the presidents of other countries, actually negotiated who is going to have an influence on the Straits, 1945. So the Turks have a long memory of history. We don't forget. And as that's the result why Turkey is so insisting to keep the Montreal Convention not to be challenged. Because we know if we forego the Montreal Convention, we go back to the previous, uh, previous uh, cases. The challenging and also uh, competition to control the Straits will become a defining uh, issue in the Black Sea. Let us not forget, the Montreal Convention was done to provide security to the Soviet Union. It was not about Turkey. It partly was about Turkey, restoring the sovereignty of Turkey on the, on the Straits. But the main definition, the main defining characteristics of the Montreal Convention was to provide security for the Soviet Union in the Black Sea. And the countries who signed the convention recognized that when you challenge that, they challenge the ownership of the Straits. So that's why Turkey is still keeping uh, its option in that sense uh, open. So finally, let's look at the Caucasus uh, for the scenarios. What would happen in the Caucasus after all this geopolitical mumbo jumbo, let me say? The worst case scenario, the worst case scenario is the possibility of sequel over uh, of the Ukrainian war or Russian Ukrainian war. And I would say this is a real possibility. Uh, people are thinking that the war in Ukraine is almost over, it's stimulated and it's not moved. No. This summer, or towards the summer, most probably we are going to see another push by Russia, if they are able to. Right? And then we have to see what would be the Western response, not the Ukrainian response, but the Western response. There is already talk, as you know, of sending uh, non-official Western um, soldiers to the ground. Yeah, there was a rumors, or, or even the news, that the French legionnaires are already in, uh, in Ukraine. And there is a, we know that a paper was circulated among the NATO countries to asking whether they are, some of them at least, are willing to create a coalition of willing by the French. So this, this is the direction that that conflict is continuing. Whether Russia, by Russia, or by any other actor, the spillover to the Caucasus is possible? Yeah, it might be. This is the worst case scenario. Another part of the worst case scenario is, the, is what would a defeated Russia in, in Ukraine would do in its neighborhood? I know people here in the Caucasus, in Central Asia, in other neighboring regions of Russia um, are thinking about this. What would a defeated Russia do to recover its its, its uh, pride. Would Russia become militarily more provoking in the Caucasus, for example? Would they revert back to their previous action of uh, poking regional differences or, or, or this so-called frozen or non-frozen conflict? I don't know, but that's the worst case scenario. The best case scenario is to lead to some sort of a regional opening. Uh, uh, in a very interesting way, the wars both the Second Karabakh War and also the Ukrainian uh, the war in Ukraine has opened up possibilities in the Caucasus towards more integration with the world and especially with the West. Uh, this is a this is an uh, po uh, 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 interesting opening. Now. Uh, there is a possibility of uh, a further uh, in, uh, interaction uh, and further connectivity, increasing the connectivity. Uh, the Middle Corridor project, 
linking China to Europe through the Caucasus, especially if uh, we can manage the, 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 the unsolved conflicts yet. Uh, that uh, real possibility also. So this is the best case scenario, creating this middle corridor, creating further in, uh, uh, connectivity uh, with outside worlds, and leading to regional integration. That's the, that's the best case scenario. What's the realist scenario? Um, I'm always uh, living with the, um, uh, towards the realist scenario. I think somewhere in between. The history of the Caucasus uh, have shown us that continuation of no war, no peace situation would be the norm for the next few years or the next 10 years, decade, couple of decades. Uh, this would continue to have sustain, sustainability of the tensions. Tensions in the region will continue, whether it's between the regional countries, uh, between, uh, especially between Azerbaijan and uh, Armenia, or uh, between regional countries and outsiders, or outsiders over the region, between Russia and Turkey primarily. So the tensions will continue in this region. Uh, some of the we have we will see some of the in, some improvements in the connectivity uh, in the best way that I talk, not full, but some of it, uh, because most of it is really dependent on the solution of the problem. We will see balancing action from outsiders, uh, the outside actors, over the region, on the region, and in the region. So third, we will see increasing balancing action of Turkey against Russia in the Caucasus. We might see some cooperation between United States and Turkey in the Caucasus, because US-Turkey relations seems to be moving to the right direction in other regions, so it might also spill over into the Caucasus. Uh, we might see continuation of uh, ambiguity on behalf of the three countries. The ambiguity uh, 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 and kind of in between, between this in foreign policy for the three Caucasian countries uh, seems to be the defining uh, uh, position. It, it, it looks like the best option when you don't have a very clear option. Because moving clearly towards the West invites Russian uh, reaction. Moving towards the Russia is nobody wanted. Moving to any other direction is not a real option. So in between this, in between this, and oscillating between different actors seems to be the uh, order of the day. Uh, in this kind of an environment, no clear regional project idea to further regional integration might survive. I mean, I know there was a suggestion of, um, especially from Azerbaijan and Turkey, is three plus three. It's, it's, it cannot get out of the ground because of the very clear objection of Georgia uh, to such a project. Um, only way to open up the region necessitates external push and external involvement. This is quite clear. The regional dynamics do not produce by themselves regional integration processes. However, as I said, any kind of an external involvement brings dangers of uh, military involvement and increasing tensions also. So that's, I think, is the dilemma of the focuses. We will be uh, facing that in the future.